Well, um, welcome wildlife enthusiasts. I'm Elitris Niels. I'm the executive director for Conservation Catalyst and your host for Wildlife Wednesday. And I'm joining you from sunny Tucson, Arizona in the United States. If you would, please use the chat box and let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, and Conservation Colloquy is a transdisciplinary platform for holistically unraveling global problems between people and wildlife. Wildlife Wednesday is a free webinar for wildlife professionals and students interested in wildlife coexistence. These take place the first Wednesday of every month. Those of you familiar with us, welcome back. And those of you new to uh, Conservation Colloquy, you are in for a real treat. There's an innovative presentation by a world expert that's applicable to participants around the world. Um, and an informal question and answer and discussion session at the end, which is my favorite part. Um, not only is this on Zoom, but it's streamed live on Facebook, which many of you are joining us from, and it's going to be recorded and posted on the Conservation Catalyst website and also on YouTube. Uh, we'd love for this to be as interactive as possible. So if you could please turn on your video so we may see your lovely faces and start to form our global conservation community. Uh, please also use the chat box to send us questions and comments so that we can learn how you're applying this information um, or if you've experienced parallel um, problems or scenarios um, that we can all learn from each other. We typically reach dozens of countries and we're now also being used as a teaching resource in both K through 12 and also university classrooms. So each month we highlight interdisciplinary scientists conducting relevant conservation research. And our guest today is all of those things and more. Um, so Tandwe Muitwa is, um, was a graduate student um, at the University of Arizona um, and we were in grad school together. Um, unfortunately, we talked about last time, um, I was in Africa most of the time you were in Arizona. So um, our path yeah, crossed very right. often. Um, and it's it's a, a definite regret of mine that we didn't get to spend more time together because we were the only ones working on cats in Africa and um, just have uh, are very much kindred spirits, I believe. So um, anyway, hopefully our paths will cross um, in Africa, which would be even better. Uh, so, um, uh, Tandy is a wildlife biologist working with the Zambian carnivore program and she has an incredibly diverse skill set um, that spans both the ecological realm and also the social science realm and um, really truly works at that nexus of human carnivore conflict um, and um, she's going to um, tell you all about her incredible research. Um, she's also a National Geographic Explorer and um, was she's an alumna from the Obama Foundation um, of Leaders Africa program, which is um, uh, very admirable. Um, and something I really deeply admire about you, Tandy, is um, your passion and drive. And you'll see um, she's got this incredibly contagious smile. So it's so great that we re rescheduled this so that you can actually see her. Um, and um, we are also um, featuring um, Tendi as a um, wonderful woman of wildlife for her incredible um, work that she's done with female conservation leaders. And um, your Zambian Women Conservation Training Program is, is really pioneering and fantastic. So we applaud you and thank you for your efforts um, to promote uh, women in biodiversity conservation. So if everyone could please join me um, in welcoming uh, our incredible guest and um, I will turn it over to you, Tendi. All right. Um, thank you very much for the kind intro and I'm excited to join uh, today's session. Uh, fingers crossed my internet holds because one power cut then yeah, unfortunately uh, won't be able to continue, but I'm, I'm hopeful I'll be able to go through this presentation and um, have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, so today's um, session, I'm going to be talking 
about uh, developing human carnival conflict mitigation program. Um, it will just be mostly on the things we've learned so far and what is it that we are trying. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to do just a quick intro of our program here just to set the scene um, a little bit to give you an idea what have we predominantly been working on and then also uh, where are we going forward with this um, conflict mitigation program and what is necessitating it at this point in time. Um, so you should be seeing a map of Zambia with a little red square to just give you an idea of where I am at the moment. Um, I live and work just outside a national park called South Luangwa, uh, but our organization, uh, Zambian Carnival Program, works in three ecosystems in the country. One of them um, is the Liwa Plains National uh, the Liwa Plains National Park out in the west, and then the Kafue National Park in the center there. But my base of operation is in and around South Luangwa National Park. As an organization, um, our primary goal is around carnival conservation as well as ecosystem protection based on the needs and uh, distribution of the carnivals in our area. So our approach to that is based on currently three pillars, but a rework of this graph is going to include four pillars um, that one of the newer ones being uh, related to human carnival coexistence, uh, which I'll spend most of this presentation talking about. But the first pillar of um, our work is conservation science. Um, so we primarily started as a wild dog research organization, but obviously now we work on uh, five large carnival species across the country, and then four of those species here in the eastern part of Zambia. And the conservation science work is targeted around understanding um, and identifying threats and limiting factors to the persistence of large carnivals in this area. And then also understanding what is the evolving nature of those threats, because we've seen from the time that we've been working here that this new things that come on the scene that weren't an issue of concern um, historically, and one of them we'll be touching on today. Um, and then the second pillar um, or the second approach that we use to carnival conservation is um, conservation action. And this is targeted at, identify, at, at addressing the threats that we have um, identified. So I'll touch on this a little bit more again. Um, and then the third one is talking about conservation capacity and conservation empowerment. So this is centered around skills transfer, but then also building sustainability into the work that we do, as well as being able to expand our reach outward at the, at the country level. So our conservation science work is done in collaboration with different organizations. First of all, it's with permission from the Department of National Parks in wildlife and it enables us collect information on these species such as lions, wild dogs, leopards and hyenas that is um, used for the management of um, the carnivals as well as their landscapes. Uh, but our main areas of research are those that I have up there. So we want to understand different aspects of the population, you know, what is happening, what's the sex and what's the sex ratio like, what's the sex and age distribution, what is happening as far as growth, is there stability, is there decline, that sort of thing. Um, want to understand distribution, what sort of areas are these animals using, um, diet, what are they eating, what are they selecting for, um, genetics, and then impacts of the more uh, prevalent conservation issues, what are the impacts of hunting, poaching, <laughs> excuse me, and, and things like that. So most of this work is done with the help of uh, number one, radio callers. Uh, these radio callers are put mostly um, here in the Luangwa on lions and African wild dogs. But in the other two sites that we have, there's also cheetah. 
that are a third species of focus. And then for animals like leopards, we don't do any coloring with them. We do more um, the studies with remote sensing cameras. Um, an important source of our data as well is uh, citizen science. So this is just information coming in from different uh, sectors of, of, of society and the community. So these are safari guides, guests that visit the national park, um, tour operators, fishermen that are up and about in these areas. Um, and so this is quite valuable information because we've been able to add um, entire groups of you know, study animals, entire prides and wild dog packs based on this information. Earlier on, before the presentation began, we we're just talking about um, new coalition of lions uh, of male lions that has just moved into our area and it's been we've been able to know about them and have pictures of them thanks to um, the data we get from uh, people that are just out and about in the environment and then we also do um, herbivore transits to get a sense of what is out there and what do these animals have available over time and across seasons as well um, and so um, lion coloring and wild dog coloring happens so that we're able to track these social groups of carnivores. In lions, we try and do one individual per group. In some cases, two, depending on where the animals are, how cohesive the group is, and what is the risk of conflict with humans uh, for that group. So. Um, would do, but primarily it's one individual per group, and then we track the rest of the group using that one individual. Um, earlier on, I talked about our conservation action work and it being related to addressing the threats that we um, identify from our research. And this photo is just showing us some of our work that we do to limit the impact of things like wire snaring on predators. So we work with different partners, first of all, to reduce the risk. Um, but then if there are individuals that are injured or the individuals that have been reported to have you know, been affected, we, we, we try very hard to locate them and then do this field-based treatment and uh, enable them to get back to their, you know, to their social group and go about doing their thing. Um, and then from the third pillar, which is conservation empowerment. That starts, um, we, start, we try and start at the very early secondary school level. So these are grade eight students that are around um, 12 or 13, all the way up to grade 12. Um, this is through running like club activities um, that enable them to engage with science research, scientific research at the at really young age and get them to appreciate the importance of being able to do research for management purposes. So the small projects that they do are not really, you know, groundbreaking science by any chance, uh, but it's just projects that will gain, that, that will allow students to gain the appreciation for the scientific method, critical thinking, very, very basic, uh, data analysis, but then the process also allows us to identify people that are motivated and interested in taking this up as a career in in future, and then we then provide the support and mentoring required by uh, people like that for them to be able to join the field. Um, and then we've got various training programs for people outside of uh, secondary school, so these are just you know, school leaver training programs, um, programs that are for university level students or entry level biologists. And one of them is the Women in Wildlife Conservation Training Program that we are now running at all the different sites um, in the country. And so this is designed to give opportunities, first of all, for young women that are interested in joining the field. Um, if, you know, they hate it completely, that's okay, um, but hopefully if they love it, who will, will provide the mentoring and, and training from, from you know, the professional side to say, okay, this is how you can grow in this field. So we, this way we're excited about, but then we also have um, other training programs for uh, wildlife vets, 
for example, because wildlife medicine is one of those things that's becoming more and more, uh, you know, popular and more and more useful in the in the type of work that we do and the different landscapes that we work in. And then, yeah, other programs include uh, just general conservation biology training and then internships for secondary school, sorry, for university level students that are, you know, wanting to gain experience and just scope out what's what's out there. So those are um, uh, pretty much a, uh, a summary of the, the activities that we do. Like I mentioned, this talk is mostly going to be around human wildlife conflict. And this is related to lion predation on uh, livestock. So the map that you can see up there is one showing some of our collared lion groups. So we fit uh, different types of collars on the different groups that we study. Some just have basic uh, VHF collars and then some have satellite collars. And these are some of those satellite collared groups that we have. And you can see from that map that a lot of them occur along the park boundary, which is in gray. Um, and they just right on the edge of the game management area, which is in that slight uh, beige color. So what that means is these lions that occur on the edge are very likely to run into conflict with people. We follow about 22 to 23 different groups. And out of these groups, maybe only two are predominantly just inside the park and one of them that just moves park only and never gets out is that one you see there in that uh, yellowish color. But everything along this age um, comes into contact with people. And as conflict increases in the area, these are all potential uh, problem lions. So the work we've been doing um, on human wildlife conflict and most of the stuff I'm going to be talking about is in relation to just these two prides, this one and particularly the one in green because it's the one that's completely now outside the national park and very rarely goes, um, very rarely goes back and forth uh, into the gray area. But it's, this is just within 100% community land. So just to dial back a little bit, the conflict problem in the eastern part of Zambia and especially around where I work, historically it hasn't been an issue uh, just because this place had huge sense fly infestation. Um, anybody that brought livestock into the valley um, it would very quickly die because of uh, a disease that sense flies pass on to livestock. Or you know, if they do survive, it won't be beyond just a few animals. But you know, with changing land use patterns, um, the density and, and the number of sensor flies in the area has reduced uh, drastically in certain places, and this has made the valley quite conducive for um, livestock rearing. So there's still places of you know really good grass areas, water. And the fact that there's fewer sister flies out there, um, it means now that uh, livestock can come in and survive to a great extent. So we started seeing this problem grow uh, gradually and it became a bit of a concern because it, it, wildlife conflict is high on the list of issues in, in many places. So places like you know, parts of Kenya and Tanzania there's the conflict there has existed for years because of the pastoralist communities that live well, right close to uh, species such as lions and hyenas. But here we've had an area with lots of lions, lots of other predators, but very low um, livestock densities. Therefore, the problem wasn't a concern. On the list of threats to carnival persistence, we mostly had issues to do with the illegal trade um, in bushmeat and snaring bycatch, uh, but not so much uh, human wildlife conflict uh, linked to retaliation by people that have lost life or that have lost uh, livestock. So this issue, um, like I was saying, has grown slowly. And so at the very beginning, 
we we had assumptions to say what is what what's the nature and extent of this problem so our main assumption was okay this conflict was driven by pastoralists moving in from the plateau into the valley in search of you know actual greener pastures um and then we had assumptions about uh what sort of animals were being kept we primarily thought okay since it's the pastoralists um that are coming in from the plateau very likely it's uh, cattle that they're bringing in and it's cattle that um is being taken and, and hammered by these animals so we thought it was driven the problem itself was driven by encroachment into wildlife corridors and other areas previously um, occupied by uh, by wildlife and so we we had a, a list of other um, a list of other assumptions as well but you know we thought before we proceed and design a mitigation program or get one off the ground it's important uh, number one to um, just you know get a deeper understanding what's the problem like and then also uh, talk to people that had dealt with this problem before so yeah that's one of the images which you know a few years back you would not have seen you know such fat looking cows and a good number of them moving down the road this this wasn't a common sight but there's, there's quite a few um and so again sites like this there, there were people that kept maybe chickens and ducks but they went you wouldn't see many uh, sheep and many pigs and goats or sheep even uh, just because everything that came into the valley would would die very quickly. Um, so at the very outset, as we were thinking of setting up this, um, you know, mitigation program, we thought it would be worth our time to go out and talk to people that have done these things for years that have worked on the problem, um, you know, having some success mitigating it. And so this is how um, a colleague of mine and I ended up visiting two uh, well-known projects in uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, one of the projects we visited in Tanzania was uh, the Ruaha Carnival Project. And then uh, in Kenya, we went and visited Owasso Lions just to see what were the approaches that they were taking to uh, mitigate human uh, lion conflict. So it was quite an interesting trip. There were very vast uh, cultural differences between the landscape that we work in and then also what we found on the ground over there, um, because primarily the people here are not pastoralists, it's subsistence farmers and also subsistence hunters for generations and generations. But, you know, we worked in, in Tanzania and Kenya, they worked with um, the Maasai, for example, that had been pastoralists for years and years, and they had different attitudes and beliefs towards livestock rearing. So it, it was quite it was, it was quite an interesting trip. We learned so much about what mitigations are they putting up on the ground and what is working. And it, it was it was yeah by by far really one of the most beneficial things we've done. So for example, some of the things they were, they were trying were uh, chain link fences um, that they were working to install within the community. So it's things like this, you know, we could admire from a distance, but not adapt because we have a high snaring problem here and that would be transplanting problems into the area, but over there it worked perfectly. But anyway, um, in general, we learned uh, so many things. I think the main uh, takeaway points that we came up with was the need um, was the need for uh, empathy when dealing some of these when dealing with some of these problems. These are people's livelihoods, um, and so we should come into the problem and into the situation with a human heart that understands that okay, somebody has lost you know, their source of income. This is something that we're planning to keep and sell for like maybe buying medication or sending a kid to school. So when dealing with those issues, yeah, we had to learn to be um, empathetic. And then something that was really important uh, was 
sitting down and talking to people and understanding things from their perspective. So we had huge assumptions about what was driving this conflict. But then we, when we started going on the ground and plotting out some of these areas, we found that most of our, most of our assumptions, especially in the high conflict zone, um, were not really, you know, they didn't hold for example, a lot of the conflict was not happening in newly settled areas or areas that had been settled illegally, but they were happening in um, old, old settlements that had been there for years and years since the 60s. And so just sitting down and, and talking to people was, um, was, was quite important. And then just listening to also the experiences that people had had, um, this was quite beneficial as well because we learned um, a lot about what was the pattern of these incidents. When did animals get lost um, or get killed? And then also what sort of species were the animals taking? And so we, we, we went back to, to the drawing board with all these things. And something that we found um, beneficial was collaborating with different partners on how to address this problem. This is also something that we learned uh, during the time we, a colleague and I visited uh, Kenya and Tanzania, uh, the stress, the importance of um, collaboration and partnerships, and then being able to work flexibly around addressing this issue. So here in our area, we, we started working very closely with a group called Conservation South Luangwa, and then also the Human Wildlife Conflict Department of the Department of National Parks and Wildlife. It was all a learning process for all of us because both of these organizations had had years and years of experience dealing with things like human, uh, human elephant conflict and then also conflict with things like hippos and buffaloes, but having lions and hyenas cause uh, problems in the community was a new, uh, a new, new thing for all of us. So being able to sit down and say, okay, what is uh, possible in our area? What resources do we have and how can we, um, you know, how, how can we band together and, and, and start to make a difference? So this is, um, this is something that continues to today. It's still a development, it's still a developing program um, very much, but being able to have partners that you can share resources with and expertise with uh, has been massively, massively beneficial. And then also um, an, another thing that we've been doing is moving around the community and meeting different community groups. So one very important group that we've started working with is the community resources board. And these are the people that live within the community itself and they are in charge of um, different things related to natural resource management within community areas. So these are people that are also learning at this point to think of budgeting for human carnival conflict because a lot of the time again they're used to dealing with elephants hippos and buffaloes and that sort of thing so uh, being able to partner with groups like that uh, has been very beneficial and then also um, the other thing is trying different interventions um, if you remember i mentioned earlier that one of the assumptions that we had was that lions were out in the villages attacking cattle that were being brought by these new people that were moving in from the valley, sorry, from the plateau into the valley. And therefore we had a completely different idea of what is it that we should try, um, you know, on the ground to help and solve this problem. But, you know, from talking to people and spending time in the community, the findings were actually, um, you know, it, it, presented a different picture. It was more to do with, the livestock losses were more to do with, you know, smaller livestock such as pigs and goats. And therefore we started experimenting, okay, what sort of structures can we design to be predator proof? Um, and then see how they're able to, 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 to reduce the problem in the, in the hotspots. So this is one of those uh, structures that we put up um, again, through working with different partners and different 
uh, community groups. And so luckily these have held up pretty well, but the challenge has been, you know, it looks like a simple structure, but we work in communities that, you know, are, are, are really poor financially. And so building such uh, structures for livestock has proved a challenge for some people. But the good thing is, you know, as I'll show later on, people are finding out, are finding alternatives to some of these expensive inputs, such as maybe um, iron sheets and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and so in addition to trying different interventions, we've again worked on impact on education programs for different community areas. So there's been people that have had conflict linked with livestock predation. And then there's also people that have had uh, conflict linked with you know, human safety, that sort of thing. So these are some of the, 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 the topics we've been um, educating the community about. Um, we've been teaching people to properly and correctly identify tracks of different carnivore species. So the animals like leopards, lions, and hyenas, we've been talking to people about how do you distinguish these prints? And then it will also enable us better understand, you know, where are the animals moving and then where are they causing problems once uh, community members promptly uh, report to us. And then in addition to just these uh, community-wide uh, sensitization programs, we've taken to also talking one-on-one -on -one with, um, with, with livestock farmers. And these are very small scale. It's just people trying their hand at raising a bit of livestock so they can um, have a bit of extra money for buying uniforms or other things. But it's like I mentioned earlier, these are people that are traditionally not pastoralists. These are subsistence farmers that are doing something new. So that uh, one on one discussion about you know how better how best can you raise your livestock how do you need to protect them they've, they've also proved beneficial and some of them have moved from structures like this which are incredibly easy um, for a, for a lion to pull apart to get to the goat or the pig that is inside there to something a bit more robust a bit stronger and these are some of the structures that, that people have, have, have started building. So these, I think we're going to work with them later on to see how can we further strengthen these structures. Um, and then also going forward, how can we encourage other people to um, you know, adopt what others have tried? And so this targets mostly uh, pigs and goats. Uh, so, and then, for areas where there is cattle conflict, we've also um, started to trial out uh, some boomer reinforcements or reinforced enclosures based mostly on the work that other organizations have done in places like you know, Zimbabwe, for example, um, in Namibia, that is basically the premise is preventing the lions from seeing what is inside the boma. And then that will likely lead to them, you know, not being able to cause any problems. So it's been um, it's been one of those things that it's it's like a, at at this point it's very much still a a trialing phase for many things, and we're we're really throwing everything at the problem just to see what works. So we've learned from our friends in Zimbabwe that. You know, if you use these um, you know, types of noise making devices, very simple contraptions that you usually see at sports events called vuvuzelas, lions and other animals don't like them. So um, other livestock farmers have been trying out these things just to see how they'll work. And so far, you know, there's, there's a lot of promise and like I said earlier, with partnerships with community resource boards, we're seeing how we can scale up uh, some of some of these issues. But yeah, you know, the like I said, the problem is still in existence. It's pretty. Um, it, all the interventions we're trying are pretty new, but uh, we know we're still trying to collect information regarding 
the distribution of livestock in the area because we had massively underestimated. We're trying to get an understanding of, um, you know, to what extent is this problem driven by encroachment versus just, uh, excuse me, new um, livestock farmers trying their hand out at, at the business. Um, but it's, 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 I think it's slowly, it's slowly coming together. And as we continue to work with partners, we look at it as um, very much a work in progress, very much designed to be flexible and adaptable based on where and when uh, the, the problem uh, presents itself. And so that is um, pretty much what I had to share. And yeah, uh, I think if there's any questions, um, I'm happy to, to take some, I'm, I'm really pleased I'm hoping you've been able to hear me because there hasn't been any flag to say stop talking, we can't hear you. So yeah. Well, wonderful. Um, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, wow, you guys are, you, you've got your work cut out for you for sure. <laughs> but, uh, and are involved yeah. in so many different facets of this. This is really fantastic. Um, so I, I welcome anyone to uh, you know please chime in if you have questions or um, have discussion points that you'd like to, to talk about. Um, we'd love it if you could if there's any possibility to um, you know to pop up on screen so that we can see you that makes it a lot more interactive. Um, but if that's not a possibility, you are welcome to um, type your questions into the chat box. Um, we do have a few questions that have already come up. Uh, someone would like to ask um, if you have tried um, fox lights or lights as a Ooh, fox lights. Yeah. Um, yes, actually, we we're trying um, lights because you know we've we've learned and heard from people that just having some sort of lighting around uh, bombers is a good deterrent. And so what we're using are actually just <laughs> strings of Christmas lights, really. <laughs> um, uh, or fairy lights, as some people call them. And so, yeah, when those have been put around bombers, um, it, you know, our, our, we have our team monitor from time to time, I think at, at a two week interval to go around those bombers and check to say what is going on, have you had lions come into the area? And then we can also see from the lion satellite collar the places that they've been to. And, and quite amazingly, yeah, the bombers that have those lights, they there hasn't been any losses of livestock there. Um, it's been in the places that have lights and, and there's been losses of livestock, it's been mostly when the like livestock, the, the lights didn't work well or, or something, or maybe there's there just some issue, but they're, they're proving quite successful. So it's one of the things that we're trying, but then we're also just massively pushing for much stronger, more predator resistant um, enclosures. All right, thank you for that. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, I hope that's successful. Um, we have a, a, a question, uh, asking, uh, coming to us from India and asking if you've come across any case studies of Asiatic lion conflict with humans and what do you see as the main difference uh, between African and Asiatic lions and conflict with people? Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, I haven't come across any uh, case study linked to that but yeah now I'm, I'm interested I think it's something that I'm uh, I'm going to look up you know you know India and us being the only two places that that have lions but yeah I, I definitely need to look up um, more information there but I, I just know that it's a small um, isolated population that has had you know different issues is linked with disease but as far as conflict conflict with humans I think it's something that I would um, I'd love to to learn more to learn more about. Good point. 
And then, uh, could you please, um, there's a, another question coming in. Uh, could you please talk about how your work is funded and you know, where does your funding primarily come from mm -hmm. um, to support all these <laughs> great activities that you're working on? Oh uh, yeah, it's from all over the place. <laughs> so we, we funded mostly through um, like small, small grants. So that's why it's, um, you know, we, we're constantly grant writing and, you know, receiving rejections, writing grant reports and all that stuff. But the, the, the our biggest um, supporters are, um, you know, WWF in, in Zambia through the Netherlands office. I think that's been our long-term uh, supporter. And then we have grants from the um, EU through the IUCN SOS um, initiative. Um, we have uh, grants targeted at big cuts conservation from National Geographic. And then we also have um, some other some much smaller donors um, from just different places. And then we're also trying our hand at uh, crowdfunding through a platform called uh, Milky Wire. I, I think they've just launched recently and they, they're pretty much in the experimental phase, but their goal is to help fundraise for conservation through uh, crowdfunding. And then in return, we just produce regular um, updates, regular updates on the different projects that we do. And so based on the different activities and pillars of work that we have, there are people that are interested in funding just research. There are some that are interested in funding, um, you know, human wildlife uh, coexistence, more recently through like the Lion Recovery Fund, for example. And then there are people that are also just interested in funding training programs and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's different, different pieces um, kind of thrown, thrown in together. Yeah, good point. We can definitely relate. <laughs> uh, I think that um, there's a, a question coming in. Um, mm -hmm. Feel free to um, unmute yourself if you want and, and ask a question. Were you talking to me or oh, someone else? Oh, yes, um, any, there are several. There are a few folks. So uh, if you've got one, we'd love to hear from you. Yes, um, thank you very much, Tandy, for this wonderful talk and very insightful look into Great. the work you're doing in Zambia. Um, you talked about uh, the importance of listening to uh, local people's experiences in mitigating human-wildlife conflict and uh, coming with, uh, you said, human heart and empathy. Uh, is it still difficult for researchers to uh, accept local people's indigenous knowledge? Or um, what would you say is the secret for this uh, collaboration um, between researchers and, and local people? <laughs> Interesting question. Uh, thank you. So yeah, it, it's one of those things I think that's a huge discussion within the conservation circles. So a lot of us that are in wildlife management and you know conservation science in general, we have come at it from the biological sciences, right? So that's what we're, we're trained to do. Um, I, I think there's still a skills gap as far as incorporating social science, you know, research into um, into conservation in general. And uh, I think going forward, what would help make this whole collaboration easier and much better is just, you know, opening up the conservation to the conservation sphere to more social scientists and saying there's room for you guys is expertise there. So it's not just about uh, population ecology 
And as we are learning very quickly, there's a very strong um, human dimension that we have to take into account. So I, I, I think from experience, we, we, it's not like, I don't think scientists don't want to engage or don't want to um, incorporate this very useful knowledge, but it's more of also not knowing how to do it properly. Um, and that's where I, I think many of us can benefit from, from you know, and more training in this area, because it's very, very clear that science, conservation science should not just be about the biological aspects of the species of the species that we study, but should also be about, you know, what is the nature of the interaction between the communities that live side by side with these species. And then I, I think the big thing in order to make it work, again, it's um, approaching the issue or getting into the situation with, you know, respect, uh, getting into the situation with it, with like, you know, being able to listen and understand to what the other person is, is talking about. Because many of the times we come in with plenty of assumptions. Um, we feel like we already know what people are going to tell us. We feel like, okay, we, 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 we've, let, we've read papers about this problem from place A or place B. Therefore, we kind of have a, a good sense of what's going on. But in, in, certain, in certain situations, that's not the case. So coming in, in with like, you know, humility, first of all, knowing that we don't know very much, we don't know how to do this, we're just learning. And then also just being able to be respectful to people's knowledge and input, and then being open to changing our, our preconceptions. That's wonderful, thank you very much. It's such such a great question and, and such such a great point. Um, I was having actually a really phenomenal conversation yesterday with a colleague in New Zealand, uh, and you know, we, were, we were talking about you know when we talk about the problem, we're talking about the livestock producers, right? It's the farmers that's the problem, but when we talk about the solution, mm -hmm. we often phrase that as like we're the solution, and you know and and. Um, and just having that, you know, the way we even talk about these issues uh, is you know, also creating barriers to us being truly collaborative and you know, resolving mm -hmm. these in, in a collaborative way that, that it, it truly works. And so um, I think that's, that's just a, you know, really um, insightful feedback, Tendi, on, on this, because I think you're, you're exactly right. Um, too often we you know, don't have the training that we need and then we, you know, come in there full of assumptions and feeling like, you know, we have, have this right to impose these, um, you know, to have these, to impose these, um, whether they're structures or beliefs, you know, on, on people. And then, you know, in many cases, unfortunately, they're not as successful as they could be if, if we just work together from the ground up, which, which is really exciting to see that that's what you guys are doing. Um, so. I applaud you because it takes a lot more time, but in the long run, I feel like it's a lot more successful. So, um, so it's it's fantastic to see that that's what you're doing, and I think a lot of that comes from. I mean, you're part of that community. That's where you live, and um, and I think that also gives you a different insight and allows you to come in much more with that you know human heart and empathy and you know truly wanting them to be successful as well as also wanting you know the lions to be successful. Um, yeah, and I think we need to always keep that in mind yeah. as conservationists. And yeah, and, and the other thing, it's quite shocking also, like, you know, you'd think that, okay, we live in this community where we're supposed to know so much, but until you get out there talking to people, you'd be surprised about, like, how I, I just live 10 Ks away. How do I not know this? So even coming from within, you can have a lot of assumptions. Um, for example, one of the assumptions we were looking at was saying, ah, there's so many poorly maintained enclosures. And so we assumed that, okay, maybe they're kept by women who don't have the skills or the knowledge to build 
these bombers and 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 stuff like that but the the shocking thing was when you actually go down on the ground and see whose enclosures are best maintained you know in the best way people can it's usually the opposite so there was a lot of women putting in more time into maintaining these things than our initial assumption that oh it was the men because they can go out and cut poles and do all these things um but yeah even coming from within you can have tons and tons of assumptions and and, and get so much wrong great great really great points um yeah and you phrase that really eloquently, so, uh, so we appreciate that very much. Uh, other other questions or comments? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, is there a demographic of uh, farmers that are more receptive to what you've been doing than others, or? Like a tolerance level that you can see. Interesting question. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So the the tolerance levels that we've noticed is the people that have um, come into the valley with livestock from um, the plateau, for example. These are traditional uh, pastoralists, and then there's also people facing conflict that have been centered in these areas for like you know 60 years these are settlements that have been present 60 years plus um we find that in those sort of areas it's a bit more like you know why are these lions coming into my zone but the the thing really the only thing that has changed in that case the lions have always moved through these areas but the thing that has changed is now they spend a bit more time there because there's easy pickings from um, there's easy pickings from the poorly housed like pigs or goats, for example. So yeah, it's a, it's a much different interaction when you're talking to people that are on the fringes of the conflict zone versus those that are in the center of it, but then also in much, much older, um, much, much older enclosures. And I think that's been, that's been the most, um, that's been the most difference and and yeah, so because they they also the people that are in the fringe areas usually have um, they'll have cattle um, and then also maybe a mix of uh, sheep and goats and so I think they are more aware of the fact that they're in that interface between the completely wild area and then um, then the human settlement. So they they're slightly more tolerant and understanding that there could be an interaction with wildlife um, there. So it's, it's been yeah, mostly having to do with where those people are located on the landscape. Yep. Then I had a follow-up question too, if that's okay. Um, how persistent uh, are these lions? Do you find that you're one step ahead of them? Or I imagine they're really smart and can work things out pretty well or? They're very persistent. <laughs> unfortunately um like I, I said when i showed the map earlier um our biggest problem um lion is just a pride of two females and i i think one cub and then from time to time the males that they're associated with so like right now they've come up with a system that you know they'll they'll, they'll hang out in one area during the day and then come down during the night, eat a couple goats, and then shoot back up to the <laughs> to the safe zone. So it's 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 something like that. They're, they're very quick to learn, uh, but then they also change their patterns depending on uh, what season of year it is. So in the dry season, when there is a bunch of emaciated impalas and uh, puku, they they tend not to hit the area as much. And this past month or two, they've, they've behaved a bit. Um, they haven't, uh, you know, caused as many problems, but, uh, you know, luckily it's just those same lions. And so we're trying to 
you know, it's it's a cat and mouse game sort of. So when we do a lot of work on like Boma improvements in one area, then they'll cross two rivers and go hit the places that haven't, you know, lent a little bit. So they 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 they're pretty they're pretty smart like that because yeah, two months ago they they moved from their usual area and then started targeting those <clears throat> those poor enclosures. And so hopefully we'll get to a point where for them, there's not so much of a reward if they come out into community areas to try and hunt because, you know, hopefully would have gotten most of the farmers to work really hard on the bombers and they, they're quite secure. And so they'll have fewer successes getting livestock and hopefully move back up where they can uh, hunt wild game. Thank you for your, uh, your time and your talk and uh, for answering my question. That was great. Thank you very much. If anyone else has any um, final questions or if anyone um, has similar experiences, particularly with um, carnivore um, coexistence um, with livestock producers, please feel free to, to share and, and chime in. We'd love to hear um, how your experiences parallel um, what's happening in Zambia. Um, because I think um, so much of the work that we're doing, Tandy, is, is um, very similar. Um, and you've had very similar experiences to, to what you're experiencing um, in Zambia and Namibia. Um, you know, so very similar problems. Um, but you know, because we're mostly focusing on caracal and smaller predators, it's just on a, a you know, smaller mm -hmm. scale, but the this, this same exact issues. Um, so. Uh, yeah, that you're exactly right. What are the caracals most? What are uh, the caracals most uh, taking? So um, they actually don't take livestock very often. Luckily, um, however, when the cats do take livestock, they consistently take livestock and have can have a tremendous impact on livestock producers. Um, and so that's not to be underestimated at all. I think one of the worst things we can do as conservationists mm -hmm. is to come in and say that carnivores don't often take livestock <laughs> because you know it, yeah. it only takes one um you know and, and that can be hugely problematic uh, but um uh, but it's primarily sheep and goats um so even though they're a small cat mm -hmm. and they you know are fully capable yeah. of taking um uh, you know adult small stock and that can be um, quite problematic so and so it's you know dealing with um you know, similar problems, just in a different landscape, um, with different predators. Anyone else have experiences in other parts of the world with, with predators that they'd like to share with us? And someone did ask uh, if you were familiar um, with uh, the work that the Lion Guardians are doing and um, Lila Haza and in Kenya. And, Yeah, um, we're familiar with, um, with with the work that they're doing, and I, I think it's a it's a, a very good program that we're, we're thinking like you know down the line we can come up with something similar. Um, so um, the only differences I think that we um, noticed with uh, it's mostly centered around the culture of the tribe around here, and then also um, over there because I, I think they've uh, built it off of that already existing culture of the Maasai and then also centered around what roles do uh, people have in within the society and and so here the slight difference is that we've got primarily um, an, an, an agriculturist uh, society or like a, a like um, agricultural tribes that are just okay growing crops and then they haven't had lots of exposure and experience dealing with things like lions because um, you know we've, we've heard about different traditional practices that exist in East Africa for example where it's regarded as you know a rite of passage or like a show of bravery if you're able to go and chase down a lion and so gradually we're thinking how do we adopt a similar type program 
um, or certain aspects of it in this community that you know in some places still very much terrified of, of lions and then being able to uh, do similar kind of work with the lion guardians. So they do you know, lots of, of good, good key stuff and really good work to document all these conflict incidents that happen and then also being embedded within the, the, the community. And I think over time, as we develop our program more and more, would, would like to adopt certain aspects of it and while figuring out how, how do we make it work in this area. Okay, um, any final thoughts or comments? Oh, I had a question still. I was able to ask that. Um, I was wondering when it comes to talking to like different members of the community, do you find that you have any, um, I guess, um, um, not retaliation, but I guess refusal to use some of the concepts that you're offering, or maybe they don't or not interested in actually um, using some of the programs or opportunities that you're given to help them deal with their wildlife? Um, sorry, can you repeat? There was a bit of feedback and I, I couldn't hear you clearly. Oop, we try over here. Um, do you ever actually have to worry about um, different people um, in terms of not retaliation, but maybe they don't want to use the programs they're offering, or maybe they're refusing outside help with dealing with their predators? Um, do you have to deal with people like that? Or maybe how do you go about them maybe working with them or working maybe around them to sort of keep your program going when it comes to those type of people? Um, so, yeah. Um, you mentioned, do we have concerns around retaliation? Is the retaliation for us or the predators in this case? Um, I think in, if, if it's either one or the other, we, we're we trying, most of the things that we're trying at the moment is so that we don't get to the point where uh, communities are killing or poisoning lions in retaliation. Um, and luckily, um, fingers crossed, you know, we, we don't get such scenarios. The two uh, females I've been talking about as being, um, as, as, as being the pretty much the things, the, the, the two lions that have kept us running around have luckily, you know, been able to come and go without any drama for um, for quite some time. And so we, we're grateful from that front because I think people have been very patient um, and not, you know, trying to actively retaliate because that could be disastrous. There's a lot of lions that are moving up and down in the, in the game management area. Um, and so if somebody you know, just decided to say, okay, we're gonna retaliate. We've we've had enough of this. It would be it would be pretty bad, and the loss would be quite dramatic over a short period of time. And then from just our um, interaction with the community, are there people that are just you know not interested in um, hearing what we have to say or trying or offer or, or like you know trialing or adopting what we have to offer? Um, you know, luckily the majority. Of, of the people have responded positively. Um, and then of course, there are some people that have been visited many times to say, can you make these changes? But they, they just don't want to. And those are the people that have been repeatedly, you know, those are the people whose enclosures have been repeatedly hit. We've, we had one man that had, you know, went down from 10 pigs to zero because he just made no change whatsoever. And I think the lions figure that out pretty fast. They're like, you know, if I go over there, it's like a drive-in restaurant, you know, I'll get what I want and take off and, and that's it. So um, unfortunately, um, you know, they've had to learn the hard way, but it could also be a cautionary tale to say, you know, we're just asking that you try some of these things and then see, and see how it works. Um, and then just when you, go out and talk to these people after these losses have happened. 
Um, we try and implement something we learned visiting Awaso Lions or Ruaha um, in, a, a few years back. It's just the fact that first of all, yeah, you, you just come in and, and let people vent really because emotions will be high. Uh, be ready to take some time to sit and talk. Don't instantly arrive at the scene and say, okay, I'm gonna pull my data sheets out and start recording you know, how many predators came, what time they came in and that sort of stuff. You kind of gauge the situation and see um, what does the person have to say? Are they willing to talk to you after? It might be that you have to come back to the scene, you know, after people have calmed down a little bit. But it's, it's amazing what that can do because it discolates um, the human to human conflict quite significantly. And you know it's it's been quite remarkable just what it, spending thirty minutes letting the person vent can do. Um, so instead of like leaving the scene with high tension, people angry, you find that at the end of it you are able to have a civil conversation, and then you can go on to offering solutions and alternatives. And by the time you are ready to go, they're like, "Here's two pumpkins, go." And so it's uh, it's it's quite um it's it's quite interesting just how being patient and being able to listen um can do but it's very very charged environments that you that you're working through because um understandably people are concerned about not only their people are concerned about not only their livestock but they're concerned about safety of their kids as well with lions coming into in and out of the village and sometimes you know at one point when we moved this lioness from from one of these areas the lioness was just eating sitting and eating this pig about 200 meters away from the house so it's it's quite a, a tense situation that you're walking into people are worried about their kids um, they're worried about themselves and they're walking from the well to their house and like at this time of year that we have right now when the grass is really high you can't even see very far it's a very tense very tense scenario so yeah you just walk in cautiously and ready to listen and then sometimes uh, ready to turn back without your assessment getting done if it just seems like you know people are too high strung beautifully put beautifully put um, yeah i think i think that uh, that's the case you know with, with anyone who's losing their livelihood as conservationists we always have to use that approach you know whether it's elephants eating crops or you know livestock you know, killing um, you know, killing someone's goats or pigs. Um, yeah, really, really well put. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, I did think um, we have one um, final um, remark um, that uh, someone was asking about livestock guarding dogs, which is a really great segue because the conservation colloquy next month is on livestock guarding dogs. So. I'd love to just um, really quickly, awesome. if you could just tell us if um, if people do use dogs and um, and kind of what scenarios they seem to work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we haven't gotten to this stage yet. Um, we we when we visited Ruaha, they had this guarding dog program that they were trialing. I think they were using Anatolian shepherds. Um, or something, I can't remember the exact species of uh, dog. And these are giant dogs with a super loud bark and they were quite effective, but um, the environment that side was pretty difficult for them to adapt uh, to. And so a, a good number of them got sick. And so they were trying to think about how can we crossbreed them with the local variety then hopefully create more disease resistant dogs or dogs more suited to that environment but then there was also 
a size issue because uh, shepherds were huge and the local dogs were quite tiny and so the mating was a was a bit of a challenge um but i think over here too if we got to that stage um that's something we would also want to think about like you know how are, how suitable are the dogs that we'll be using for this purpose so something quite small with a huge bark yeah that would that, that would be that would be good for us but we haven't gotten that far yet we haven't um yeah we, we haven't tried it um it, it all just because of those learning about what people have gone through in in the past because yeah disease was an issue and then also you know getting the right diet for them drugs wise um and and issues like that but uh, there are people that have um guard dogs as well so these are the just animals that will bark when like a predator shows up. But unfortunately here as well, we've had dogs get taken by either, you know, leopards, hyenas or lions sometimes. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's definitely a two um, in the two box, but you have to find the right breed of dog, possibly something that's more disease resistant and easier to feed. And then also um, quite crafty when it comes to running away from predators. Very good point. We had an excellent point that those dogs, um, you know, feeding them is, is very costly. Um, and that's that's very, very true. Mm. Um, and, you know, those big dogs are, are very expensive to feed and that can be really problematic for people that are operating already at the margins, kind of at the fringes. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and that was um, Gail, who was the presenter a few weeks ago. Her um, graduate work uh, examined livestock guarding dogs, and that was one of the problems associated with using them. Although you're right, they are they can be an excellent tool in certain scenarios. Um, they're not, you know, mm -hmm. it's not kind of a, a blanket solution. Um, and so, um, really, yeah. Good point. yeah. Well, good. Um, and so, I think if there aren't any um, further comments or questions. Uh, we would really just love to thank you so much for your time and thank you for that really exceptional presentation that just touched on so many different uh, aspects of, of your work and showing just how incredibly complex it is uh, in saving these carnivores. But um, they're very lucky that they have you and your team um, working to help protect them um, because I think that their future looks, looks really bright with, with the great work that you guys are doing. Um, and um, just a reminder that um, if you missed any aspect of this talk, um, that the, this talk was recorded and will be posted on the Conservation Catalyst website and on YouTube later today. And um, you're welcome to share that information with your friends or colleagues or go back and review it. Um, I also want to make a plug. Uh, if you want to nominate yourself or someone else to present, and um, Tendi is featured as a wonderful woman of wildlife. Um, if you know another wonderful woman of wildlife that you think would be uh, a great presenter, please email conservationcallably.com. Um, our email is in the chat box as well. And, um, and um, our next uh, speaker is the 5th of May, so the first Wednesday of every month, the 5th of May, um, and it'll actually be a dual presentation, which is really exciting, and we will be talking about uh, livestock guarding dogs and their benefits and also costs in conservation. So a great opportunity to look at um, you know, using them as a tool uh, possibly for carnivore code systems. So um, thank you again, everyone from joining us from all over the world. And, and we really appreciate this. And thank you again, Tendi, that was just um, so uh, insightful and enlightening. Thank you. And thank you for the beautiful pictures of lions. We all wish we were there with you right now. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you for, for showing those to us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you, Tendi.